Psalm 90. This is a Psalm of Moses. It's the only one we know that he wrote. He might have wrote something, another Psalm, but we just definitely know it was his. Lord, you've been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were formed, or excuse me, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn man to destruction and say, return, O children of men, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it's past and like a watch in the night. You carry them away like a flood. They're like a sleep. In the morning, they are like grass, which grows up. In the morning, it flourishes and grows up. In the evening, it, cut, it is cut down and withers. For we've been consumed by your anger and by your wrath, we are terrified. You've set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. For all our days have passed away in your wrath. We finish our years like a sign. The days of our lives are 70 years, and if by reason of strength, they are 80 years. Yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? For as the fear of you, so is your wrath. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long, and have compassion on your servants. O oh, satisfy us early with your mercy that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days in which you have afflicted us, the years in which we have seen evil. Let your work appear to your servants and your glory to their children. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Let's pray. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, we praise you this day for you. We praise you for enabling us to worship you. We thank you, Father, for a day in which we get to worship. There's no better way to spend it. And we pray that you will bless us as we do. We pray that everything we do and say will please you well. Bring a smile to your face and honor to your name. Father, we have so many that need our prayers. We are so glad that some have been ill that are back with us, and there's still some others that are not feeling very well. Father, we all struggle spiritually in some way because we have that enemy. Please give us the strength to withstand him and forgive us when we have not withstood him. And Father, we know it doesn't take much as long as it's in it's your word and we're in you. Please bless us this morning. Please help us and strengthen us. It's in and through the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 500 and 501. 500 and 501. 500 and 501. Oh, the fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me ever to adore thee, may I still thy goodness prove. While the hope of endless glory fills my heart with joy and love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I've come. And I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood oh to grace how great a debtor daily i'm constrained to be let thy goodness like a fetter by my wandering heart to thee never let me wander from thee never leave the god i love here's my heart oh take and seal it seal it for thy courts above oh worship the king all glory us above and gratefully sing his wonderful love our shield and defender the angel 
ancient of days, pavilion in splendor and girded with praise. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light. It streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust and feeble as frail, in thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end, our maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. 94. We're going to try this again. 94. As I tell my school kids, we'll just muddle through it if it's not right. <laughs> Come, Holy Spirit, guest divine, on this baptismal water shine, and teach our hearts in high strain to praise the lamb that sinners slain we love thy name we love thy laws and joyfully embrace thy cause we love the cross, the shame, the pain. Oh, praise the Lamb of Gunner slain. We sing beneath thy mystic blood. Obey the sin, thy cleansing blood. We die to sin and sin a grave. With thee beneath thy yielding wave. And as we rise with thee to live, oh, let the Holy Spirit give the sealing auction from above the breath of life the fire of love 895. 895. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When I feel afraid, I think I've lost my way. Still, you're there right beside me. Nothing will I fear as long as you are near. Please be near me to the end. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I will not forget your love for me, and yet I'll forever be wandering. Jesus, be my guide. Hold me to your side. I will love you to the end. 
thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Would you please mark 197? 197, that will be the means of encouragement this morning. 197. Then turn to Matthew, the fifth chapter. Matthew chapter five. Not long ago, I was given words of advice from a preacher that had learned it from an older preacher. And the words of advice were, sometimes it's okay to preach short sermons. I hesitated to tell you this is going to be one of the shortest for fear that it was going to be one of the longest. <laughs> because it is so easy for us to look at Matthew chapter 5 and verse 7 and just gloss over it. But the text simply says, blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the merciful. If we would take this verse and use it more often in life, the greatest sermon preached by the greatest preacher would sink in even more than we do today. It is mercy that's going to last longer than cruelty. But because we have bought into a myth that says we're entitled to everything, then we get in our minds that it's okay for us to be merciless, but you make sure you're merciful to me. Folks, we've been made in the image of God. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, the Bible said, let us make man in our image. He didn't say, let me make man in my image. Let us make man in our image. And since we have been made in the image of God, we know there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There is the doctrine of Trinity that is biblical. Some people don't teach that, but it is biblical. We know God. Now, the one thing about God that we don't completely get is we don't get these two passages right here that say the same thing. Exodus 34 and verse 6, I'm sorry, bear with me, those who are watching. Let me move this over because I'm in the way. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> Exodus 34 and verse 6 and Jonah chapter 4 and verse 2 say the same thing. God is merciful. God is gracious. God is long-suffering. And aren't you glad that he is? There are things that, have, that I will study about in history in this country, and we call it the greatest country in the world because we still think it is, and, and yet we, we think it's going down the wrong path, and it always has been. And we, we look back to the glory of the 50s, and we look back to the glories of the 60s. By the way, I want you to know that the worst decade in the history of this country for religious affiliation is not in this decade. It was in the 1940s. The 1940s was what? Right at the end of World War II. And because the Soviet Union collapsed and because of the fact that we just think that we're living in the most peaceful time that ever has existed, oh, I know China is there, oh, I know Russia is there, but we're never gonna lose this country that we've gotten too comfortable and relaxed, in my opinion. And yet you study about things that have gone on. How about gambling? How about bootlegging? How about a president that, that got his money, his family got it from bootlegging and being a mafia? And, and, and without getting on the soapbox too much about it, I'm just... The things that have that you look at in history and you go, are you sure it's always been a godly country? <laughs> are you sure it's always been following Judeo-Christian principles? I know that's what it was founded on. I know that's what people knew. But ever since the world has begun, ever since time started, 
from the point of the Garden of Eden, has it not been corrupt? Let me show you how corrupt it is just to, to, for you to study about. In Genesis chapter 6, God said, I am sorry I ever made man. Verse 5. I am sorry I ever made man. But Noah, verse, verse 8, found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And he told Noah, go and build an ark 450 feet long, 75 feet wide by 45 feet high. It took him 100 years to do it. Now, here's the thing. Who spends 100 years building a boat except for Noah? <laughs> because what is what it was Jesus doing in the days of Noah? 1 Peter 3.18 said he was preaching to them, trying to get them to repent. And when he destroyed every living creature that walked on the earth, those that had lungs, how many people came out of that ark? Eight people. That's all that were saved. Seven of every clean animal, two of every unclean animal. They went in two by two. And when they came out, it took five chapters. Five chapters. Genesis 11, what happens? The Tower of Babel. And God saw what they were doing. They were trying to build a tower to God's place. And when God saw what they were doing, it caused God to come down and look all around. And what did he do? First thing that he did was, he says, I'm going to confuse their language. They couldn't talk to each other. Then I'm going to do other things like change their different nationalities I'm going to change things because what did the devil do? He made it, and we're going to talk about this another time. He made it a garbage dump, but God turned around and cleaned it up. When we let Satan do what we, he does with us, what he wants to do with us, he turns us into a garbage dump. But who cleans us up? The Lord. And how do I know that? Because Matthew 9, 13. The Pharisees are interrogating Jesus as they always would do because they always wanted to be right, but they took things to the extreme. You see, they, they'd make it right for you, but they didn't have to be right. See, they were just born into it, and so it, that's just all you needed to be. Guess what? They were wrong. They were absolutely wrong. And when Jesus is preaching, he quotes back from the book of Hosea, chapter 6. And he, taught, he tells them when they're talking about this business of fasting. And, and, and I got to tell you, church got into it, I think, a little too much. But fortunately, we finally understood that that was something voluntarily. You didn't have to go do that. But the Pharisees turned that into a religious thing. And Jesus said, Matthew 9, 13, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. But Jesus said something right before that that I intentionally wanted to say here. And that is, go learn what this means. Go learn what this means. Now, this is not very easy for people of the world, much less is it easy for Christian people. Let me explain to you what I mean. I learned this the hard way, that we are creatures of habit. The other day, I sat somewhere, and all of a sudden, somebody said, are you sitting in my chair? And I told them the story of Chuck Swindoll's parents. In case you didn't hear it, let me remind you. Chuck Swindoll, he's the one that is very famous across the country. And he said, my parents and I and, and my brother, we went to church. And he said, we stood at the front door and there was someone visiting. And Ma looked at Paul and said, somebody's sitting in our pew. And she said, what are we going to do? And Paul said, well, I guess we're going to go home. And he said, and we did. We went home because somebody was sitting in our pew. When did it become our pew? I went to the bus yard one day. 
parked in a particular spot. This lady bus driver chewed me out. And I said, I didn't see your name attached to it. I didn't see your name branded on it. She got testy with me. And so we had teachers at Bayard trying to question why we park at a particular gate. And the reason is you want to confuse kids? You want to confuse little kids? Park at a different gate. They cannot figure this out. I'm not making fun of them. I'm not ridiculing them. But they cannot figure out that they that just because I park at a different gate, that's still their bus. And so we par, I park at gate number three. The physically challenged bus parks at gate number one. And the bus that goes in front of me parks at gate two. And he drops them off at gate two. Now we're really going to confuse them because I can only drive in the morning because of the superintendent's statement. And so let's see how that goes for a few days. But it always takes about a week to put this in. Now I say that because we don't want to be merciful people. In fact, if we're made in the image of God and God has promised blessed are the merciful, they'll obtain mercy. Wonder what Jesus, wonder what some of the lessons Jesus taught about. Well, let's go to the first one, Matthew chapter 18. Matthew, the 18th chapter, beginning at verse 21. Jesus has just told a story. He's just, I'm sorry, he's just commanded his disciples, what Paul would have commanded us, and Paul did command us to do, and that is be united. We've been studying that on Wednesday night. Do everything you can to keep unity. You got a problem with your brother, or if you know if your brother has a problem with you, go to your brother or sister. Then, if that does not solve the problem, take one or two with you. That by the mouth of two or three eyewitnesses, the word may be established. If that doesn't work, take it to the church. And if you don't, and he or she won't listen to the church, treat them as though they're a heathen. And he tells a story to illustrate it. There's a man who owed his creditor a bunch. I don't know how much that is currently in, in equivalent, but I do know at one time it was like $35 million. He owed his creditor a bunch. And he went to the master and he pled for him to give him time to pay. And the master was so moved with compassion that he forgave him all his debt. Man, we talk about rejoicing. Talk about wonderful. Talk about, oh my. But the story has a twist. That man went out and found somebody that owed him very, very little. And he told him to pay him. And the man who owed him says, give me time to pay. He took him by the throat. And threw him into prison. Which was legal to do. Until his debt was paid. And when the servants saw what he had done, went back to the, to the master and they told the master. And the master summoned him in and said, how could you have done that? I forgave you of enormous debt and you couldn't forgive of little debt. You know what Jesus taught there? Number one, you and I always owe somebody more than they owe us. Well, you don't know. You don't know what the... Uh, you, da, da, da. I've lost hearing. I've told you this, but I'm going to repeat it. I've lost hearing, part hearing in this ear because of a Christian woman who could not get around the fact that she owed more than she was owed. She was so bitter about what her husband did, and he did something bad. Do not go home thinking that he didn't do anything bad. He did something terrible. 
And she said, and don't you dare tell me that I ought to forgive. And then she couldn't figure out why I wouldn't speak to her for the next 15 minutes. What I wanted to do is throw her out of the car. Something her husband had done in the rain with her son. But somebody gave me some encouraging words the other day, said, you're better than I am. I'm not better than anybody else. <laughs> I just know one day who I'm going to stand before, and I know who I fear more. And so when I've been wronged, and I've been wronged again, not as bad as last year, glory to God. Peter says, take it. It's commendable to the Lord. And this man said, and, he, and, and the master took that man with his family and threw him into prison. Now, that would have been okay. We would have loved that story, except would you look at verse 35? So my heavenly father will do to each of you. If you from your heart does not forgive one another's trespasses. Jesus, why'd you have to do, say that? Jesus, why'd you have to do that? I didn't put it in the notes, but would you go back to the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6? Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. Most of you can quote that. We hear it at our Catholic friends' funerals, and sometimes we hear it at at the Unitarian Church and Episcopalian Church especially. And our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And that's where it ends. But King James added, for thine is the glory and the power, etc. Now, I quoted that not because the kingdom's going to come. The kingdom's already here. I don't want you going home and say that. But which one of those did Jesus redress? Which one of those did Jesus go back and talk about? Oh, he, he would have been great. It would have been great if he had talked about praise. We can't praise God enough. Wouldn't it have been wonderful if he had went and talked about our daily bread? I mean, we, we get to eat well. And, and wouldn't it have been great if he'd have talked about all this other stuff? The one he talked about the most was forgive us our debts. Forgive us our sins. But that's not what he said completely. He said, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Look at verse 14 and 15. If you forgive men their trespasses, your Father in heaven will forgive you your trespasses, but if you will not forgive, your Father in heaven will not forgive you your trespasses. Why? Go to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. Luke 18 is saturated with some good stuff, but we all know how to talk about the, the middle part of it. Jesus is addressing the Pharisees and the Sadducees, or he's addressing who we would call Sister Bertha better than you. You know those kind of individuals. And here are two men that go to the temple to pray. One is a Pharisee, the other is a publican, the King James says, or a tax collector. And if you think the IRS is not popular today, it was worse in Jesus' day because as long as Rome got their money, they didn't care what a tax collector would charge. It was legal to charge a little more because that's how they made their money, but the tax collectors exploited this with Rome's permission. And so they were really, really cruel. That's why Zacchaeus said, if I took more than, than I'm sorry, uh, not Zacchaeus, if I took more, uh, four times more 
then I'll restore it. Well, the point was that's what they were charging sometimes, four times the tax. You imagine if your tax bill was $3,000 and you owed $12,000 to the government, what kind of mess you'd be in. But I've always found the IRS be pretty honest. We've made mistakes, and fortunately, the mistakes are usually in our favor. I, I just couldn't believe it the first time. Well, yeah, it was a, there was about a $10 off thing, but it's in your favor. And so we, we added the 10 to your return. I thank God I'm not like other men. I'm not an extortioner. I'm not unjust. I'm not like this heathen pointing at the tax collector. And the tax collector couldn't even raise his head. But he beat his chest saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And the bombshell... Jesus said, you know who went home justified? It wasn't the publican. It wasn't the one that fasted twice a week, give tithes of all I possess. So they usually, they usually fasted on Tuesday and Thursday. And it's this tote mark you always have to keep every week. And here's Jesus, and he said, the, pub, the publican, the tax collector, went home justified. Here's why. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. Why then do you not know about the story of John 8? Verses 1 to 11. We always, and I made the mistake, so I want to make sure that I, I'm always clear about this. We make the mistake of thinking this story is about the adulterous woman. It's not reason we always do that is because we didn't know about adultery a lot. <laughs> now, it seems like it's common. And here is Jesus. And he is in the square or somewhere in the square and where everybody can see. Him. And the Pharisees bring to him an adulterous woman who was caught in the very act of adultery. And here's Jesus riding on the ground. To me, he's doodling. I know people have wrote, oh, he wrote words of mercy and he wrote words of compassion. And he, I don't buy that. I might be wrong. But what we do know is he's riding on the ground. He's riding on the ground. And this woman, she's ashamed. She really, this is the mistake I used to make, that she really was an adulteress, but John says she was, and so she was. But they weren't interested that she was committing adultery. That was not their point. Their point was to trap Jesus in his words. And so what did they say to him? Moses said, that she should be stoned to death. No, he didn't. I'll explain what I mean in a minute. Moses said she should be stoned to death, but what do you say? And Jesus keeps riding on the ground. And they pressed him. And he looked up, and this is all he said. He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to cast a stone at her. And he went back to writing on the ground. From the oldest to the youngest, they dropped their stones. Why did they drop their stones? Why didn't they beat this woman to death? Why didn't Because they'd been guilty of innocent blood. Well, now, wait just a minute here. Hold on. No, no, no. She is guilty. You missed one part. And this is what Jesus knew. And this is what Jesus was teaching. You bring the man who was committing the adultery with her. You see, they didn't care whether she really committed adultery or not. 
I seriously wonder if they would have ever done anything to her. Because you see, they weren't interested in following the law. They were interested in trapping Jesus in his words. And from the oldest to the youngest, they dropped their stones, and Jesus is still writing on the ground. And that woman, you can just imagine what it must have been like for her. Because you see, there was only one who really had the right to stone her to death. It's the one riding on the ground. He's the commander in chief. He can do anything he wants. He's the king of kings. He can do anything he wants. And what does he do? He looks up. <laughs> I, I laugh at the words of Jesus. I'm not making fun of him. Shouldn't say it that way. I get greatly amused at the, at the situations in which Jesus speaks. Because do you honestly think that Jesus didn't know that they all walked off? Do you honestly think that they didn't take their stones and, and throw them or not throw them? Some of them wanted to stone him to death. And he looked up. And he didn't say, go your way. He didn't say your face made you well. He didn't say, he didn't, he asked her a question. You see, I went to college, <laughs> show you how stupid I was. I went to college and I wanted to be a psychologist, psychiatrist, so I can figure out how people think. Guess what? I have learned more from the word of God about psychology than I have in any textbook in any, any situation I've ever been in. And I'm more of a sociologist than I am a psychiatrist. I watch people's behavior a lot. You know what he did? He didn't, he didn't tell her anything. He asked her a question first. You ever wondered why he asked that question? What did he ask? Where are your accusers? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Don't miss the wording, because I have. Woman, where are your accusers? You imagine what it must have been like for that woman? I don't know what she's wearing. I've been told she wasn't hardly wearing anything. I don't know if that's true or not. Here's Jesus, and he asked her the question, because what is he trying to do? He's trying to direct the attention to whom? Jesus. Jesus. And she says, they're nowhere. He said, neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. You know, wonder what, I wonder what that woman did when she walked off. I wonder what she did. Oh, I know television and I know movies can dramatize this, but I really wonder what she was thinking. And folks, that's what he's called us to do. To be a merciful people. Years ago, I read a letter from a visitor to a, a congregation of Lord's Church. And this visitor was pointing out all the things that he noticed that members of the church were doing. For example, they weren't paying attention to the sermon and they weren't really singing or they were just singing uh, with no heart. He said what was worse was when the invitation was offered, he said everybody grabbed their song books and started picking them up. And he said, then he said they raced to see if they couldn't get out the door. And he says, I don't ever want to go back to your congregation. I read that. And I said, I don't want to give any more invitations. I don't. Nobody responds to it anyway. Hold on. Don't throw something at me. It's going somewhere. It's not going anywhere. Nobody's paying that much attention. 
It's a waste of time. Let's stop. I love the Lord. You remember what I quoted a few minutes ago at Luke 18, verse 14? Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. Everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. You don't know how many times the Lord's humbled me. By something I've read, would you please go to Matthew chapter 11? Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Matthew 11, verse 28. We'll finish the chapter out. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take, verse 29. Take my yoke upon you. Come learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burdens light. And when I read that, the Holy Spirit started speaking to me. Oh, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to be a Pentecostal. I'm not trying to be a holy roller here. But you know what he told me? You forgot something, Springer. It's not your invitation. It's not your invitation. It's mine. And when I say, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Come learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burdens light. You better tell them. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, master. Your servant hears. The other part of this is 90% of us, 95% of us are Christians. So why do we keep doing this? Go to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Galatians 6 and verse 1. Brethren, if an individual, and I know the King James, the New King James means man, but in the context, it's an individual, is overtaken in a trespass. You make sure that you take that spike with that 12 pound sledgehammer and make sure you drill it real hard into his heart and kill him. Is that what it says? No, Galatians 6, verse 1. But unfortunately, let me tell you, brethren, that's what we've done. My home congregation needs a dose of repentance. And I've told my mother this. There was a man who did something real bad, and it was. It was awful. But he not only admitted to it, he went forward at church and confessed it, went to jail for a little while, and not one of those brethren have ever, ever tried to restore him back before he died. And my mother makes the excuse, well, what he did was real bad. Well, why didn't about three or four of you stay with him all the time, so he wouldn't do that. My mom, mom has no answer. I know there's forgiveness. Don't misunderstand me here. But it's easy to forgive when you make little mistakes. How about the big ones? If a man is overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you be tempted. Look at verse 2. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the old law. Nope. Nope. Fulfill what? The law of Christ. And folks, ladies and gentlemen, brethren, that's what we're intending to do. If you need us to help you, that's why we do this. We don't do this out of rote memorization, even though it's easy to do. We don't do this because it's traditionally done. We do this to fulfill Galatians 6, 1 and 2, and Matthew eleven twenty eight 28, 30. 
And if you need us to help you this morning, we would love to do that while we sing. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mow me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now. As in thy presence, humbly I bow. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Wounded and weary, help me, I pray. Power, all power, surely is thine. Touch me and heal me, Savior divine. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Hold on my being, absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit till all shall see Christ only always living in me. 227. 227. Two hundred twenty seven. Here before the Savior, we were lowly bow. Grant us now thy presence. Come and bless us now in the sweet communion. May our souls be fed in true consecration. May we all be led. Grant this bread now broken. May assemble be of thy precious body bruised on Calvary's tree. Grant this cup of blessing to our hearts may prove one more tie that binds us Answer in thy love. Amen. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, once again we come before your throne of grace, knowing we are so unworthy, and you are perfect. But they searched through heaven, as the song says, and they found a Savior to save poor sinners like us. Jesus was willing to fulfill your plan. And the Holy Spirit was willing to still make sure it's still truth and it still inspires. And Father, we thank you for the memorial we have before us in which Jesus took the bread that night, gave thanks and divided it amongst the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. May we never forget, Father, and it's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Three hundred thirty. Three hundred thirty.
On this Lord's Day, we assemble round the table of the Lord. Happy hearts are made to tremble when we hear his blessed word. Thanks to God for such a Savior, now enthroned in heaven above. Thanks for this exalted favor, bless the more of his love we recall his broken body on the cross for you and me give ye thanks divide and eat it in my memory he said thanks to god for such a savior now enthroned in heaven above thanks for this exalted favor bless memorial of his love and this crimson cup reminds us of that dread scene long ago when he died in pain and anguish there his blood was made to flow thanks to god for such a savior now enthroned in heaven above thanks for this exalted favor bless memorial of his love there in agony he suffered on the cross for you and me now upon the throne he's reigning blessed lamb of calvary thanks to god for such a savior now enthroned in heaven above Thanks for this exalted favor. Bless memorial of his love. And Father, we continue thanks. The thanks that we continue is what's in the cup to our minds is our Savior's blood. We thank you, Father, that he was willing to do what no one else could do. That is, the only way he could save us is to die. Because we die. And yet, thank you that you didn't leave him in that tomb, that he has been raised the third day. Please bless us as we partake of the blood, and may we never forget, it is in Jesus we pray. Amen. One hundred seventy one. One hundred seventy one. Glad you're all here this morning. Glad Lynette especially is with us. She has some dental work done. And so and Jackie's at home. I'm not sure what's going on there, but hopefully she is doing OK. One seventy one. This is my daily prayer. God bless you, go with God. Hold fast his mighty hand throughout the day. His grace your heart sustain. His power relieve your pain. Your prayer be not in vain as you travel his way. In spite of all the lies that some may hurl, Christ is the only hope of all the world. God bless you, go with God through all eternity. My prayer will always be, may you go with God in spite of of all the lies that some may hurl, Christ is the only hope of all the world. 
God bless you, go with God through all eternity. My prayer will always be, may you go with God, may you go with God. Father, we thank you for the day in which you blessed us with one more time. And we pray that we've done everything in accordance with your will. Thank you for the place that we meet. Thank you for the country in which we get to do it freely. And thank you, Father, for the country we have. It's easy for us to complain about things. It's a lot tougher for us to do something about it. And so, Father, we thank you that you've blessed us with it. And we pray for all who are in authority that we can lead quiet and peaceable lives. Father, help us to be more merciful to people as we want you to be merciful to us. We are the conduit. In other words, Father, the only Bible some people will ever read. Help us to be more godlike. Please forgive us of our sins. Keep us safe and in your care. And bring us back when we're supposed to be back. Please, it's in Jesus we pray. Amen. I thank you all for being here this morning. Thank you, my dear. Have a good week. You too. Will do.